Figures in profile, lines of people wearing very different costumes, exotic animals, gifts coming from the most remote corners of the world, ivory tusks, pottery, textiles, and lion skins. When archaeologists digging at Persepolis first beheld these bas-reliefs, they were puzzled. Why depict so many different peoples from such distant lands in one work? But slowly, clues fell into place that gave scholars the answers. The people with the ivory tusk and the okapi are Ethiopians. The dromedary is typical of the Arabs. That pointed headdress clearly belongs to the Shiites. The Assyrians are portrayed with a cart, and here are Indians with a donkey. Twenty-three nations in all carved into this stairway, representing the first great empire in history, the Persian Empire, and the many peoples who converged on its capital. The vast Persian domain stretched from the African continent to the Indus River. It included the fertile lands of Egypt and the Sudan. It expanded into Europe with the reigns of the Shiites and the Thracians. It occupied Arabia and the Babylonian lands between the Tigris and the Euphrates. To the northeast, it extended as far as today's Uzbekistan, and to the southeast, it crossed into India, and at the center, Persia, in all its splendor. For decades, these inscriptions represented an intriguing puzzle for archaeologists. In addition to being cuneiform, the text was written in three different languages, High up on the mountain of Behistun, perched atop a tall ladder, English Army officer Sir Henry Rawlinson valiantly transcribed the text. That was the easy part. It then took him ten long years to decipher it. Thanks to the work of this great archaeologist, the puzzle was resolved in 1835, and a whole new world opened up to scholars. The history of the Persians, told this time, through their own works. The Greek historian Herodotus wrote, the Persians adopt foreign customs more readily than any other people. This sentence, written with perhaps a touch of contempt, actually reveals something positive and impressive about the Persians. We are in Pasargadi. The winged genie we see here appears to be a typical Assyrian figure. He is dressed as an Elamite and wears a showy Egyptian headdress. But the genie was not found in either of these lands, but here in Persia. Along with other clues, this suggests that the concept of a unified world, and perhaps the desire to belong to one, originated in Persia, and that the Persians found pleasure in trying out the different lifestyles of the empire's many peoples. Pasargadi, founded in 553 BC, was the empire's first capital. Though later abandoned by the kings in favor of Susa and Persepolis, it was never left to decline. Inscriptions like this one have survived since that time. I am Cyrus, an Achaemenid. Though it is also trilingual, written in Babylonian, Elamite, and Persian, the words call to light one of the greatest world leaders of all time. This is the tomb of Cyrus the Great, the man who built a boundless empire from nothing in just a few years. In Cyrus' time, the economy in Asia was expanding and the people wanted stability. They wanted an end to the discord among the different tribes and peoples. There was a widespread desire to belong to a unified world. Today, we call this idea ecumenism. At that time, the concept was that of a universal empire. 
The first one to appreciate its value and to put it into practice was Cyrus himself. In Persia, if you wanted to offer a tribute to the gods, you'd be hard pressed, for there are no temples here. All over Persia, just as here around Pasargadi, altars have been found standing alone on open hilltops. The traces left by fire during sacrifices can still be distinguished. Along with other evidence, these discoveries helped archaeologists understand the nature of the Persian religion. For the Persians, all of creation was divine, the sky and the earth and all its elements. Hence, sacrifices were not held in an enclosed temple, but out under the open sky. They offered their sacrifices to the sun, to the moon, to the earth, to fire, all as elements of a single deity, Ahura Mazda, who incarnated the supreme good, an early form of monotheism. The Persians, however, did not force the peoples of their empire to believe in Ahura Mazda. They allowed freedom of worship. You could dedicate your sacrifice on the altars to any god you wished. This is Susa, one of the most important archaeological sites in Iran. Relics have been found here dating back to 4000 BC. Years of excavation work have revealed only a fraction of the city, yet the great number of foundations and the remains of massive columns and capitals confirm that Susa was a palatial city equal in grandeur to Persepolis. Historical records tell us that under King Darius I in 512 BC, Susa grew in splendor, becoming a capital together with Persepolis. But why have two capitals? At 5,000 feet above sea level, Persepolis was covered by snow for most of the winter and thus impractical for many of the governmental functions. With such a large empire to direct, the government certainly couldn't just shut down when the weather got bad. Instead, they transferred operations to Susa, a bona fide imperial capital in its own right. In Susa, archaeologists found glazed tiles that they quickly recognized as pieces of a larger picture. When they were arranged like a sort of puzzle, they began to tell a story. They fit together to make elaborate tunics, golden jewelry, a javelin, a bow, and a quiver. But who were these warriors so richly adorned? Excavation work began in Susa in 1884. The first to realize that those warriors must have belonged to an elite unit were the French husband and wife team, the Dulafois. Examining the puzzle in the light of descriptions by Herodotus, they figured out that what was taking shape before their eyes was the image of one of the emperor's personal guard units, the legendary Immortals. There were 10,000 guards to protect the emperor. When one of them was struck down in battle, another immediately took his place, giving the impression that their ranks were immutable. Hence the name, the Immortals. The king they defended represented the unified state, the power capable of imposing order. And in some parts of the empire, he was seen as a divinity. The inscription at the base of this statue, sculpted in Egypt but found in Susa, bears witness to this. To you, Darius, are given power and stability. All the plains and mountains are collected under your sandals. To you are given Upper and Lower Egypt, who worship your wondrous visage, like that of Ra, for all time. The magnificent archaeological site of Persepolis, one of the most important in the world, 
lay hidden for 2,000 years. Alexander the Great's troops, in a drunken orgy to celebrate the conquest of the Persian capital, raised it to the ground. Then time and sand buried it for centuries. One of the excavated areas is the place where the court palaces stood. But around them is an entire city of servants' houses, artisans' workshops, and everything else that served life in the king's court, still waiting to be discovered and to reveal more secrets. This nine-pound golden tablet, a treasure in its own right, is a charter and gave scholars insight into the various construction phases of the palace city of Persepolis. By examining the remains of the buildings in the light of the translation of this and other inscriptions, archaeologists were able to attribute each newly excavated area to a particular emperor. What we see here is the original nucleus, founded by Darius. This area represents a transition from Darius to Xerxes, his son, who was defeated by the Greeks. And this area corresponds entirely to Xerxes. The largest part of the archaeological site, a sort of second city, was built by the succeeding emperors down to Darius III. the discovery overturns a conviction passed on to us by the Greeks, especially through Aeschylus and his Persians play, which relates, The inhabitants of the Asian lands no longer obey the Persians. They no longer bear the exacted tribute, nor do they fall prostrate to let themselves be commanded. The king's greatness is finished. Nothing could be farther from the truth. As we have seen, after Xerxes, the King Aeschylus refers to, Persepolis expanded considerably under his successors and its splendor grew. Indeed, this did not mark the fall of the empire nor even its decline. Archaeologists have deciphered friezes and bas-reliefs portraying a moment of great celebration and expansion of the empire. This alone gives us a sense of just how strong and solid that empire was. Quite the opposite of the barbarian images that the ancient Greeks handed down to us. Archaeologists sifting through this ancient record have found images that portray delegations of different peoples. People with proud faces and erect bearing being led by a Persian master of ceremonies to an audience with the King of Kings. Their precious and symbolic gifts tell a much different tale from that of the other great emperors of history, who generally preferred to depict their subjects bound in chains. But the biggest revelation of all came from this bas-relief, found next to the processions of the peoples. The image is clearly symbolic, but what could it mean? Comparing the astral symbols with the Persian calendar, scholars have ascertained that what we see here is the constellation Leo displacing Taurus. We are thus at the first day of spring, a celebration known as Nurus. On this day, the people streamed in from neighboring areas and put up their tents around the center of the world, initiating the empire's greatest festival. Activities would take place both outside and inside the palace grounds. Those invited inside were in for a treat. of Persepolis had two grand public halls for receptions. The first one is the Apodona, the second is the Hall of the Hundred Columns. Between them is the Tripylon, a 
private room for the king and his counselors, and behind it lie the royal apartments. Only the delegations representing the imperial domains and the components of the imperial court were allowed to enter the rooms of the court. After ascending the great staircase to the level of the royal chambers, 13 feet higher than the rest of the courtyard, the delegates crowded into the apadana through this grand portico. The doors and door jams of the palace were carved in stone, which was very abundant around Persepolis, perched as it was on a terrace of living rock. The walls, on the other hand, were covered in terracotta. The Apadana, also known as the audience chamber, held as many as 10,000 people. To avoid confusing Babel, a common language was adopted during ceremonies and official acts, Aramaic, an easy idiom of Semitic origin that used the Phoenician alphabet. By using a language that they themselves had to study and learn, the Persians once again proved to be in the vanguard in desiring a common world that all would want to belong to. Aramaic was the official language of the Persian bureaucracy, an important step for developing from an empire encompassing many peoples to a state composed of a single people. After presiding over the grand procession, the king withdrew to this council chamber, the Tripylon. On the door to the Tripylon, the king is sculpted as being borne aloft by his people, an image that might allude to what happened inside. Here, the king is meeting with his trusted aides to improve the organization of his empire and to make revolutionary decisions. It would be in this chamber where the council resolved to build new roads, chart new sea routes, establish a unified system of weights and measures, and adopt a common currency using bimetal coins made of gold and silver. The north and south doors to the Tripylon, leading to the king's private apartments, are decorated with bas-reliefs showing the king entering and leaving, followed by his servants. The king and his court would have entered his private apartment up these steps. Inside the palace of Darius, you'd better be on your best behavior, or you might have to answer to the king's watchdog. What dinner time was like is suggested by these bas-reliefs. The dishes found here are made of precious metals, offering further testimony to the luxury that distinguished life in the king's court. The king, lord of the provinces and armies, appointed members of his family or his most trusted men to select positions and rewarded them with fabulous gifts. An example is this superb golden sword kept in the Tehran Museum. After the meal, the king and his entourage would move toward the Hall of the Hundred Columns. This is where the delegations would present their gifts. 
The representatives of the peoples of the empire would wait in the courtyard, and from here, when it pleased the king, they would be invited into the Hall of the Hundred Columns for the audience. This room was bigger than the first one, but located at a lower level. There was a grand portico before this hall as well. It was richly decorated, hinting at the sumptuousness and sacredness of the chamber within. Not everyone was allowed to approach the king. Sometimes you'd have to be content with just a glimpse of the emperor. When he sat on his throne in the Hall of the Hundred Columns, awaiting gifts to be laid at his feet, he was enclosed in curtains and shrouded in shadow. The sparkling of his scepter was the signal that granted the right to speak. Only a very few, as we see in this bas-relief, were allowed to approach him and pay homage with a deferential kiss. The hall is so named because it really contained 100 columns in rows of 10, a forest of stone trunks towering almost 65 feet. So those who were not lucky enough to catch sight of the king could at least enjoy the magic of this enormous hall, which evoked the vastness of the Persian Empire. Mythological animals on the tops of the columns watched over the king, protecting his city and his people. A few miles from Persepolis, archaeologists discovered this building with a square foundation almost 40 feet high. What it was is still a mystery sparking vigorous debate among scholars, not just because of its unknown origin, but also for its location close to the walls of Mount Nakshirustam. Here there are decorations carved into the rock, strange crosses, human figures, inscriptions, and four openings as if rooms had been dug into the mountain with their entrances off the ground. There are several hypotheses regarding this work. Some say it is a temple of fire, others that it is a watchtower. But the most alluring idea of all is that it once was a library where sacred texts were kept. If you get close enough to the wall, you can see figures that, more than any others, helped scholars understand what is being said here. They are Persians who are mourning the death of their emperor. The crosses of Nakshi Rustam are the royal tombs of Darius I and his immediate successors. Darius, the great conqueror who expanded the Persian Empire from India to Egypt, was the first Persian king to have carved into the mountains images and phrases that were true political messages, his spiritual testament. It is here on a mountain, not in a book, that the true history of Persia is written. That which was ill done, I made good. The provinces were in upheaval. One man was fighting against the other. I brought peace. My law keeps the stronger from harming the weaker. I repaired the city walls that had fallen from age, and I built another wall to serve from now into the future. May Ahura Mazda protect me and my royal house and what has been inscribed by me. In ancient civilizations from the 2nd and 3rd millennia BC, it is the Egyptians who occupy the limelight for their dazzling sculpture and art, the hieroglyphics they left behind, 
the royal tombs, and the incredible architecture, including, of course, the pyramids. In the Egypt of those times, merchants traded exquisitely beautiful vases, now known as chimeras. It was said they came from an island in the middle of the Mediterranean, a rich, sweet, and peaceful island, a paradise. The description enticed many Egyptians who wanted to visit. Travelers would change boats in various ports as they moved up the coasts of Lebanon, Cyprus, and the islands of the southern Aegean. One of the first remarkable sites they would encounter was Mount Ida, 8,058 feet high, in the middle of the island of Crete. In the second millennium BC, Crete was the center of a vast domain that encompassed most of the islands in the Aegean. For this reason, the Minoan civilization, named after Minos, the legendary king of Crete, was also called the Aegean civilization. On the south coast of Crete, archaeologists found traces of a Minoan settlement, Aia Triata. The excavation work unearthed a huge villa and one unusual object among the many relics found. Its painted sides depict a procession. The figures in line are all smiling, serene, and joyful. The object, however, is indisputably a sarcophagus, and the procession, in spite of its apparent happiness, can only be a funeral procession. By studying images and artifacts left by the Minoans, archaeologists discovered that everything on Crete even a funeral, was related to joy and nature, an ode to life. This contrasted sharply with the seriousness of Egyptian funerals with their rigid cult of the dead. Archaeologists also found these stone vases at Aia Triada, carved from black steatite, one of antiquity's most beautiful materials. The images on the ancient vases tell us of the world in which they lived. One character, proud and handsome, attracted the attention of scholars who sought to understand who he might be. The solution to the puzzle could not be found in any written histories. The information left to us by ancient historians is imperfect anyway, since it's based on legend and not direct observation. The only narrative we have of Crete and the Minoans is the legendary story of King Minos, whose description matches quite closely with the character depicted on the steatite vase. The resemblance is so strong that many have declared it is, in fact, an image of the king. Perhaps the only Minoan image of Minos that exists is found on this vase. The great legend tells of a monstrous figure, the Minotaur, half man, half bull, born of the union of a white bull with Posiphae, King Minos's wife. Upon seeing their hideous offspring, the king had the Minotaur locked up in a labyrinth. Every nine years, Minos would feed seven young men and women from Athens to the Minotaur. Eventually, Theseus, the son of the king of Athens, decides to kill the Minotaur. On his way, he meets Ariadne, the daughter of Minos, who falls in love with him. Ariadne gives Theseus a ball of silken twine to unspool as he enters the maze so he can find his way out. Theseus kills the Minotaur and escapes the island, taking Ariadne with him. Minos, in a rage, locks up the designer of the maze, Daedalus, but he too escapes, along with his ill-fated son, Icarus, on waxen wings. It would seem, then, that a dark cloud hangs over the Cretan world. But archaeologists warn us to distrust histories invented by one people to account for their enemies. 
The legend of the Minotaur was written by the ancient Greeks, and the Greeks were the enemies of the Minoans. The Minoans cannot defend themselves against such accusations. Their writing still remains undecipherable. Their alphabet, the so-called Linear A, is a puzzle, and one of modern archaeology's major challenges lies on a Minoan ceramic disc, the Phaistus disc. When it was found in Phaistus, archaeologists were intrigued by its spiral markings. But unlike the readable glyphs left by the Egyptians, these markings left by the Minoans remain an enigma for modern scholars. In spite of this, the disc reveals something quite extraordinary. The markings are printed, not painted, and each one represents a syllable. The disc thus contains a text, one of the first printed texts in human history, thousands of years before Gutenberg. Toward the end of the 1800s, an English archaeologist, Arthur Evans, found these dusty, interesting seals at an Athens antique market. He discovered that they had come from Crete and decided to dig there at Knossos. He began to discover the remains of elaborate and finely decorated dwellings. The floors of the houses were perfectly stacked, one having collapsed onto the other as if an earthquake or similar catastrophe had suddenly struck the city. Evans rebuilt everything that could be put back together, but the more he dug, the more he realized how strange the buildings were. The rooms, over 1,500 of them, were all interconnected, as if the whole area had been covered by a single huge palace as big as a city. All around, there were large stone horns and images of bulls. Evans understood that Knossos was an extraordinary city palace unlike any ever seen before. A city labyrinth where the bull was widely venerated. He thus discovered the legendary palace of Minos, the labyrinth of Theseus, and the secret of the Minotaur. Actually, the Minoans, as we see in this fresco, did not have an antagonistic relationship with bulls. They played with them. They didn't kill them. In Crete, they did not practice what today we'd call bullfighting, but rather something called Toro Cathopsia, a balancing contest on the backs of the massive beasts. In ancient times, the labyrinth city of Knossos was constantly evolving. The architecture would have seemed very different to the Egyptians who might have visited. The roof had openings designed to capture and channel water, but also to allow light to penetrate the interior. Light entered both from above and through openings in the four walls. The structure comprised two units, which were different from one another, but each had floors that were exactly identical. Today, thanks to the excavation work of Evans, we can project what this incredible palace actually looked like. It was a great maze that on the outside featured an intricate interlocking series of stepped terraces. Unlike the Egyptians, whose people lived in mud huts while mammoth constructions like the pyramids were erected to honor the afterlife, here was a people who created huge and grandiose structures not for celebrating death, but for living life with joy. The heart of Minoan life 
the gathering place for amusement, the place where the events with the bulls were held, was this courtyard. High above, looking down upon all the pageantry, were the royal apartments. The central courtyard contained both the rooms reserved for the royal family and enough outdoor space for the festivals of the citizens of Knossos. It was a democratic setup that allowed the different social classes to mix more readily. The center of Minoan power, the throne room, also looked out onto the courtyard. What is amazing is that the throne room of this ancient city is still intact today, and Minos's original throne is still in its place. This throne, in all its symbolic power, has been copied and now seats the president of the International Court of The Hague. This homage to the Minoan civilization came about thanks to the work of archaeologists who debunked the Greek myth of the Minotaur and restored to Minos his rightful fame as a fair and just king. In the Minoan society, women were equal to men. Today we might say liberated and emancipated. They wore colorful clothes and adorned themselves with precious jewelry. They played an important organizational role in daily life and were the animators of court activities. In fact, one of the most beautiful rooms in the entire city palace of Knossos was dedicated to a woman. Here we make our way through the colorful corridors of the palace to the Queen's Chambers. In this apartment, more than anywhere else, one can see just how dearly the Minoans felt about physical well-being and comfort. In addition to festive decorations found everywhere, on the door frames, walls, and ceilings, this set of rooms was characterized by refined sanitary facilities and by double walls to keep the noise out. Statuettes of women lying dormant for thousands of years were brought to light in the Knossos digs. Their clothing is elegant, and in a unique fashion, their breasts were left exposed. This fact incited both curiosity and divergent opinions. Scholars debated whether that was normal wear for Minoan women, or if it was exclusive to certain priestesses linked to a particular cult of worship. The women portrayed with serpents in their hands are certainly priestesses. Their garb is sacral. But the excavations also yielded dozens of paintings where bare-breasted women appear in scenes of daily life. This fact led scholars to believe that this uninhibited mode of dressing was widespread among Minoan women. The belief is also supported by observations of many other Cretan paintings. The Minoans were completely immersed in a benevolent natural environment as mild as the climate of these latitudes, and one that they fully delighted in. The artifacts unearthed by archaeologists present a new image of the Minoan civilization, not the legendary gloom of a fatal labyrinth, but a lush and joyful Eden. Crete the home of King Minos and the civilization he began was the center of a large empire that included hundreds of neighboring islands in the Cyclades, 
one of the most captivating areas in the world. One island in this group is Santorini, once known as Caliste, literally the most beautiful. The black igneous rock that covers most of Santorini is the ancient residue of a volcano that is still active. The volcano expels a compound that produces a sand particularly well suited to making mortar, and the island has many quarries to extract it. In one of these quarries, remains were found of ancient walls, which immediately attracted archaeologists' attention. Excavations unearthed buildings and relics that had nothing in common with the ancient Greek civilization. After pottery, frescoes, and an entire village were found, a few hypotheses were advanced. It was clear that a tremendous eruption had buried the village with sand and ash, which later solidified. The village, known as Akrotiri, was thus connected to one of the greatest natural disasters in history, the disappearance of half the island of Santorini into the sea in about 1500 BC. The frescoes and the pottery, very similar to those found in Knossos and Phaistos, suggested that Akrotiri was one of the many commercial ports along the routes used by the Minoans in their crossings of the Mediterranean, trading their highly refined products. It was a culturally rich city, worthy of the civilization that we now define as Minoan, and the dwellings are the proof. The houses of Akrotiri had two or three floors and were built with a light and very elegant style. They all exhibited a great number of openings, allowing air circulation and filling the rooms with light. As in the Cretan palaces, the perimeter walls contained the drain pipes for the sanitary facilities that all discharged into what was an incredible thing for the time, a sewer network. The stairs and floors had a flexibility to them. The attic had wooden beams and a network of reeds and branches, lightweight materials covered with finely packed earth. What is the explanation for such a building technique? The volcano, now and then, caused tremors that shook the island. The houses of Akrotiri were built this way as a sort of elementary but effective anti-seismic system. The Minoans lived in a rich and verdant land. In Crete, abundant water flowed down from Mount Ida to irrigate the fields. They were surrounded and defended by the sea, which they sailed as the uncontested masters. They lived in a society without conflicts. And yet, their civilization suddenly disappeared. Archaeologists wondered how a civilization that had left such significant and impressive traces could have come to ruin so quickly and mysteriously. In putting together pieces of the puzzle, archaeologists realized that a catastrophe like the explosive eruption of Santorini would have disastrous consequences even beyond the island itself. They calculated that the half of the island that sank into the sea would displace an enormous amount of water and generate a tidal wave towering a hundred feet or more. Its direction could only have been toward the south, where it would strike Crete and Knossos. As confirmation that the tidal wave really did hit Crete, Archaeologists found the remains of boats high on the slopes of Mount Ida. The Santorini volcano not only destroyed half the island and buried Akrotiri in ash, 
but it also wiped out the famous and powerful Minoan fleet, the loss of which left them exposed and vulnerable to conquest by the Mycenaeans. A civilization nurtured by the sea had been undone by its fury. Discoveries by archaeologists regarding the advanced state and the fate of the Minoan civilization, along with the disappearance of the island of Santorini, have much in common with another enduring mystery. For centuries, scholars have tried to resolve the location of Atlantis, the lost continent. The myth of Atlantis originated with the writings of Plato. It was fabled to be a happy world, experiencing a golden age, an island that was a true natural paradise, enhanced by bold works of hydraulic engineering. At the center of this island, there was an enormous residential complex immersed in a forest. And all of this was swallowed up one day by the sea. Plato had indicated the position of Atlantis was beyond the columns of Hercules, the rock of Gibraltar, in the Atlantic Ocean. But he had his information third-hand, citing the sage Solon, who in turn had gotten his news from Egyptian priests. So there are scholars today who strongly believe, given the many similarities with the Minoan world, that the disappearance of Atlantis was none other than the disappearance of the island of Santorini and the sudden decline of the Minoan civilization. What is certain is that archaeologists have found nothing similar to Atlantis or to Knossos or to the Minoan civilization in any of the peoples who came later. The Mycenaeans, ancestors of the Greeks, after subduing the Minoans, created a much coarser, more retrograde civilization, as if humanity had taken a great step backwards. Whether or not the legend of Atlantis was inspired by the Minoans and the Santorini volcano disaster, nothing detracts from the intriguing world that archaeologists have uncovered for us. The incredible artifacts left behind, their respect for the giving nature of the environment, the civility and lifestyle of the Minoans, all suggest that if this civilization had not disappeared, our world today might be a very different place. The Minoans did not get the chance to expand, to pass on the richness of their culture. They were not able to perpetuate their golden age. But what little has remained of their civilization seems to have influenced the world's sense of beauty from generation to generation down through classical Greece and modern Western civilization. And so today, we can be justified to feel that we are the children of the Cretan world, a world that celebrated the beauty and the value of women, strong ethics as represented by the fair and just King Minos, a civilization to whom a labyrinth was only a game and the stuff of legends, a civilization that seemed to emerge from the Dark Ages and learned to celebrate and live life as it was meant to be lived.